Hey, what's up, YouTube? Today we are checking out this M5 Stack Mini Encoder C hat. They cost eight bucks. They have a scrolly and a light, and they're gonna let us control our devices really easily, but we gotta get it working. So since this device uses the I2C protocol, instead of using like a normal encoder protocol, we have to figure out how to make sense of this chart. And we're gonna have to figure out a couple more things before we get that far. So let's first try and figure out how an ESP Home component works. So to help us understand how an ESP Home component works, I made this chart for us. And so in an ESP Home component, we have two kinds of files. We have C++ files and Python files. C++ files is gonna have all of our main code and the Python files is gonna let us define how the component's set up and then it's gonna be built into C++ code on build time. Then we also have folders. So folders are gonna be named, for example, light or switch. And inside there, we're gonna be able to have a custom component under the light domain. So in our example down here, we have light platform fast LED clockless. And so our folder is gonna be named light inside of the folder fast LED clockless. And inside of those folders, we are going to have the same kind of files. We're going to have an initpy and C++ or header files. So looking at this example for our mini encoder C, we have some C++, the Python file, and then a folder for light. And then of course we have our readme. All right, so let's check out how that code works. So first we're just going to check out the header file. So the mini encoder C, it is an I squared C device and a component. And so the component is going to let ESP Home register the device during setup and also gives us access to setup priority and the setup and loop functions. And I squared C device is going to help us when we're setting it up, gives us access to set the address and also read the I squared C bus. So inside of here, we have our number, which is going to be our encoder value. And then we also have our button. And so we have a couple of sensors for our encoder value, our increment value, firmware, and our button. And the way these sensors work is that they have a value and other classes are able to subscribe on them. And so when we publish a value, other classes are able to either filter so they can debounce on that value or they can just read it directly. And so in our case, we have the encoder value and the button so we can read when the button is clicked. And then we also have a trigger for when the encoder is rotated clockwise or anti-clockwise. Okay, in our C++ file, we have these addresses, which you might recognize from our table that we saw earlier. We'll go back to Chrome and look at that. And so we haven't seen this 42 yet, but we can see OXF. And then if we skip all the way to the right, we have E, and then we also have F. And so if we read on OXF, E, we can get the version. If we read on OXF, F, we can get the address. And then also for these counter values, uh, it's all split up into multiple different bytes um, because this could be a big integer. And so we have to read all those and then turn those into one value. So let's look at how we actually do that. Get set up priority is called because we're a component. So we're gonna say on IO, so right when the device is set up, try and read for this encoder because in some examples it might not be plugged in. So in the setup, we're going to read the firmware into this int uh, on the register for firmware. And so if we look at the top, we have OXFE, like in our table, and then we're gonna read that into our firmware. And then if that doesn't work, like if the device isn't plugged in, we're gonna mark this as failed and then none of the other code will run. And if it does work, we're gonna set the encoder value to zero because the encoder actually has memory inside of it and then we'll just log the firmware. So how we set the encoder value, we have this array of UN8s for data, and then we're gonna write our value to it uh, in each different bit, and then write to the encoder register. And so if we scroll to the top, we have OXOO, and then if we look in Chrome, OXOO is our counter. So we're gonna write these four bytes And if it works, 
we're all good. And if it doesn't, we're gonna mark as failed. So inside of our loop, we're gonna keep a value for our encoder. So we'll read the register for the encoder into our data and then take apart that data into our value. And then we're going to just divide the value by a value that the user can set to make the encoder less uh, precise. And so they can set it as two and it'll be half as precise. And then after that, we just check if we can set the encoder value. And if it's different, we're going to publish the state for the encoder value here and here. And if the value is less than our current state, we're gonna call clockwise. And if it's greater, we're gonna call anti-clockwise. So the user will know if it's scrolled. And then similarly, we're going to check the button. And if the button is clicked, we'll publish the button state is clicked. That's it for the C++ code. So this is the stuff that I found the most intimidating or just the most unfamiliar, uh, but it is pretty straightforward. So we have to import everything uh, that we're gonna use. So binary sensor for our button, I squared C, to actually read the device, and then our sensor for our encoder values. ESP home has a bunch of constants that we can pull in. So our config ID and our trigger ID. And then we have to import our uh, output for our light, which we'll get to later. Automation for our triggers, and then also some light stuff. So you're able to multi confis because you can have more, more than one of these devices plugged in. We have to auto load the binary sensor and the sensor because uh, we require them and we want them to be pulled in automatically. And then we need the I squared C um, class defined. So we're gonna set a depend dependency for that. And so it'll make sure the user has that defined. Cool, so this stuff just matches our code. It's our namespace. This will match our initializer for our class. So we have the name of the class, I squared C device and our component. So if we look in our header file, that matches exactly here. And then we have to set up some of our own config IDs. So these are the ones that we're gonna use as a user. And our triggers. So these are gonna be called whenever the clockwise or anti-clockwise are rotated. We're gonna skip past encoder schema to config schema and then come back to it. So config schema is what the user sees primarily. And so they're gonna set the ID for this they're also going to be able to set up the encoder and so that's going to be tabbed in because this is like a dictionary and then they're also going to be able to set up the button so these are optional so they can set up either or so inside encoder schema we have more optional values for our trigger for clockwise anti-clockwise and it looks like a duplicate here so we'll just remove that one and also they're able to set up their encoder filter so they can set it the default's one, so it doesn't do anything, but then if you set it to two, it's half precise and going forward. And then right at the end, we see the 42 finally appear. So this is where we set the default address for the I squared C to be 42. And the user can override that and change it, but this is just the default. So on build, two code is gonna run. This is gonna get turned into C++ code. So we're gonna make a new variable. This is going to be our mini encoder C component. We're gonna register that and register it as I squared C device. So at this point, we should be able to call setup on everything, but we don't have the actual values set up in our class. They haven't been set. So if we have the encoder, we're gonna make a new sensor for the encoder and then set that. So what this actually does is var is our mini encoder C and set encoder is an actual class. So if we look in here, we can find set encoder. And so it's actually calling this code in C++ on build. And we'll take apart the config for config encoder. And so that's gonna be all of this stuff. And if we have the filter, we'll set the filter. So that's gonna call an actual C++ function called set encoder filter. See, we can find all of this. And also for our 
clockwise and counterclockwise triggers and for a button. So when we build all this stuff, this is going to get turned into C++ code, and then it's going to try and run all that code. And if everything works and the user has it set up, the device will work. I'm going to explain quickly how this works inside of your YAML for your device. And so you'll have all the normal stuff. And then inside of external components, you're going to have to load this in. So in our case, we're going to load this in from GitHub. And then we are just going to put the repository, the branch, and then the component that we're looking for. And then also we are in going to include a package with all of our config for the encoder. So this just makes it easier for people to set up instead of having to copy and paste code. So on GitHub and also on your computer, there is a folder for components. Inside of that folder, each component is going to get its own folder. So on build time, ESP Home is going to copy the components that it needs into the build folder. And then it's going to turn all that YAML code and C++ code into your firmware. And so let's just quickly check out the readme for this and see how this is set up for the user. So we have our mini encoder C device. So that lines up with our component. We have our ID, which will set the ID here. And it's also used here. We set the I squared C ID. And so this isn't required, but this is going to be mandatory if the user has more than one I squared C bus. Um, and then the default address, we just have that commentated out. And our button and our encoder. And so those line up with the button schema and the encoder schema. And so on build time, all this stuff will get turned into C++ code. It'll get registered. And then it'll just work. And so let's do a little demo. Let's try it out. So inside of our mini encoder C, we have our I squared C stuff. This is pretty standard for the stick C. You can find this in the docs the two pins for SDA and SEL. So this is set as bus B. Inside our mini encoder C, we look at the bus B, set our button, make sure that's internal so home assistant can't see it, set our encoder. We divide the value by three so it's not nearly as precise. Whenever clockwise or anti-clockwise happens, we're just gonna rotate our screen. We haven't covered the light stuff yet, so we're not gonna look at that. Let's try building. Okay, we're going to try and do a live demo with our device plugged in over USB and into our encoder. So let's try uploading. It's going to take a minute. Awesome. We have uploaded the code. It's going to reboot. So now we're in the device and hopefully it does work. Yes, it does scroll. And so since it's plugged in, it will find the device on startup and let us navigate our device. Cool. All right, thank you for watching my video. If you wanna learn more, you can visit homething.io. And if you want to get set up with a device like this or order custom 3D prints with amazing quality and a great price, you can check out pcbua.com. More info at the bottom of homething.io. Have a great day.